Steve Hartman. Steve Hartman shares this story. All summer long, four-year-old Dylan Stitch was afraid to dive off the diving board. Dylan's mom, Marla, said he had no interest whatsoever in diving off. We just kept saying to Dylan, hey, why don't you try it? Why don't you try it? Uh, enter 95-year-old Daniel Biss, who was uh, in the Air Force during World War II and the Korean War. And he knows a thing or two about fear and bravery. And so when he saw a neighborhood kid at the family pool party and everyone trying to coax him, uh, Daniel knew exactly what Dylan needed. Daniel said he just needed some convincing, so I thought I'd give it a try. So Daniel borrowed a swimsuit and with cane in hand, set up to give Dylan an example. The great-grandfather hadn't been on a diving board in 50 years. And he stood up on one, ready to teach a lesson in courage, uh, which nearly turned into a lesson in first aid. And uh, Marla, Dylan's mom, said, uh, we all held our breath. We were a little bit nervous. Was this a bad idea? But Daniel said, I was up there, so I was going to go through with it. So Daniel dove for Dylan. It wasn't the prettiest dive, but he couldn't have done it better because shortly after Daniel took his last jump, Dylan took his first. And Marla said it was really neat to see this example of courage for Dylan. When you think about courage, what comes to mind? How would you describe courage? French author Victor Hugo who wrote uh, Les Mis and The Hunchback of Notre Dame, he said, uh, have courage for great sorrows of life and patience for the small ones. And when you have laboriously finished your daily task, go to sleep in peace because God is awake. Winston Churchill said, success is not final and failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. After Moses passed away in the Old Testament book of Joshua, God looks at Joshua, Joshua 1.9, and he says this, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Well, as Emmanuel continues to walk into this new season of ministry and service, today we're looking at Ezra chapter 8. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn there, Ezra chapter 8, which teaches us that rebuilding requires courageous leadership, patience, and faith. Ezra chapter 8 is all about rebuilding requires courageous leadership, patience, and faith. And today we continue in our series of Rebuild and uh, our study of the Old Testament book of Ezra. And uh, before we look at that, would you please bow one more time with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for bringing us all here today. God, each of us has a unique week, our own challenges and victories. Each of us, God, are here today to hear what you have to say and consider, uh, God, what your voice would mean in our lives. God, we gather today to worship you, to confess our sins, to give thanks to you, and to seek your hand in the midst of our journey. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would lead and guide and teach us. God, that you would take your hand and reach down and take our hand and help us up, God, that we would wait on you. Father, we pray these things in faith. Bless now the reading and teaching of your word, we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. A few weeks ago, we looked at Ezra chapter 7. And at the end of chapter 7, uh, we read that God had honored Ezra and the house of God before King Artaxerxes and his nobles. And as a result of the faithfulness of God, Ezra took courage and he gathered the leadership of Israel to go back to Jerusalem. Well, 50 plus years have passed between Ezra chapter 6 and Ezra chapter 7. 50 plus years have passed. Chapters 1 through 6 of Ezra is all about building the new physical structure, the new altar, and the new temple. 
and to establish, reestablish right worship with God. Ezra chapter 7 through 10 is all about the spiritual rebuilding of the people. And Ezra chapter 8 verse 1 begins this way. Uh, These are the family leaders and the genealogical records of those who returned with me from Babylon during the king reign of King Artaxerxes. And chapters, uh, verses 1 through 14, Ezra lists the genealogical record of all these men uh, that went back with him. And showing the genealogical records display the faithfulness of God through the ages. And Ezra communicates to these men his vision, his purpose, his passion, his calling of God to go back and establish right worship in Jerusalem. In between verses 1 through 14, 1,500 men, 1,500 men are represented there. And because in biblical times they did not acknowledge or list women and children, it's very likely that 5,000 people went back in this time, back to Jerusalem with Ezra. In verse 15, chapter 8, verse 15, I gathered the leading men at the river that flows from Ahava and camped there for three days. But we can't be certain today where exactly that site is, but we know that it's a few days' travel outside of Babylon. So Ezra's got 5,000 people with him, a few days' travel outside of Babylon, and he gathers them. And as he searches through these 5,000 people, he realizes that there's not one Levite there. And so Ezra gathers these men men specifically, and he says, I want you to go to a guy by the name of Edom. And Edo is in this area called Casaphia. And I need you to talk. Ezra's speaking to this group of men. And I need you to go there and talk to Edo and have him send some Levites to us to travel with us back to Jerusalem. So Ezra has gathered these 5,000 people. There's no Levites there. The Levites were the men who established and led uh, the worship of God, right worship in in the temple. And these are the guys that should have been out in front. But there's not one to be counted. And Ezra's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We can't move from Babylon 900 miles back to Jerusalem without temple leaders. We can't do this. Verse 18, since the gracious hand of God was on us, this band of brothers, this group of men, brought back us Sherebah, a man of insight, and the descendant of Levi, along with his sons and brothers, 18 men, plus Hashabiah and his brothers and their sons, 20 men. And since God was on, God's hand was on this band of brothers, God provided 20 people to be the Levite representatives representatives to go back, along with, along with 220 temple servants. We see that in verse 20. Before Ezra, and these 5,000 people go back to Jerusalem. Ezra says, we got to have the right team. we got to have the right people to go back. Verse 21. A couple days travel outside of Babylon. 5,000 people. Ezra says, okay, we got the right people. Let's go. No. Ezra calls the 5,000 people to pray and fast, and wait to stop. Verse 21, I proclaim to fast by the Hava River. Why? So that we might humble ourselves before our God and to ask him for a safe journey for us, our children, and our possessions. Why did he do this? I did this because I was ashamed to ask the king for infantry and cavalry to protect us from the enemies during the journey, since we had told him the hand of our God is gracious to all who seek him, but his anger is against all who abandon him. So we fasted. We pleaded with God for his protection, for his provision. Once the team had been assembled, Ezra calls the whole community to stop to pause, to wait, to fast. They have not left for Jerusalem yet. It's 900 treacherous miles through the desert, and they haven't left yet. And Ezra calls the whole community to stop and to pause. Arthur Wallace uh, wrote a book uh, 
entitled God's Chosen Fast. And within that book, uh, Wallace lists a variety of reasons, biblical reasons of why people fast. Wallace cites that uh, people fast for personal holiness, uh, to be heard by God, to change God's mind, to free captives. People fast for deliverance, for insight, to train the body for health and for healing. Ezra says here that he calls the leaders and he calls the people to pray and fast for God's protection, for God's provision. And they all gather together there at the Valley of Allah and they pray and they fast and they wait on God and they humble themselves before God. Ezra exhibits great courage here. Great courage and faith that God would protect them and provide for them. When we read that passage, verse 21 and 22, there's a sense that Ezra is second guessing. That Ezra's thinking, maybe I should have asked the king for military protection. But he doesn't. Instead, Ezra and his leaders take a risk. It would seem logical to ask the world to protect us as we move through the treacherous desert. But Ezra instead says, no, we're going to seek God's help, God's provision, God's protection. God, we want your power to be out in front. God, we don't want to muscle our way through this. God, we want to see your kingdom come, your will be done. We want to see your strong arm, God, providing and protect for us. God, we can't do this on our own. We don't know how long they fasted. It could have been a meal. It could have been a number of days. But they prayed for God's protection. They prayed for God's provision. And after, after they fasted and waited, Ezra intentionally, purposefully selects 12 men. Verse 24. I selected 12 of the leading priests along with Sherebah and Hashabah and 12 and 10 of their brothers. I weighed out for them the silver, the gold, the articles, the contributions of the house of God that the king and his counselors, his leaders, and all the Israelites had given to us. Before they left for Jerusalem, he gathered the right team, he stopped, he prayed, he sought God's protection, and then he took the next step forward. Verse 26 and 27 points out that Ezra selected these 12 men and then he begins to distribute 24 tons of silver, four tons of gold and other important and valuable artifacts to these 12 men. What does it look like to weigh and distribute 24 tons of silver. And how are you going to move 24 tons of silver? So I can just imagine Ezra, okay, guys, I've selected you 12 guys. Okay, one at a time, here we go. We got all this pile of money here. We got to move 900 miles across the desert. It's going to take us four months. How are we going to get it there? So he takes the first guy. He calls him up with a team, and he begins to count out heavy bars of silver and place them in bags or an ox cart. Hours and hours and hours of weighing and counting and establishing a safe mode of transportation to get tons and tons of silver and gold across the desert where robbers were just waiting. The counting, the weighing, the distributing gets done. And then verse 28. Verse 28. After hours and hours of counting, Ezra looks at these 12 guys, this band of brothers, and he gives them a charge. And he says to them, you guys, you're holy. You're set apart. You guys are special. And the articles that you're transporting, God's valuables, those are special. Those are holy. The silver and the gold are a free will offering to the Lord your God. Guard them carefully until you weigh them out in the chambers of the Lord's house before the leading priests, Levites, and the heads 
of the Israelite families in Jerusalem. After the hours and hours of counting, Ezra looked at these guys authoritatively, soberly, empowering, and says to you, these guys, you guys are a band of brothers. You need to guard this stuff with your life as well as your families in the journey ahead. The money is now in your possession. Ezra understands that he can't transport 24 tons of silver. He needs a team to do it. And so after he gathers it all, counts it all out, gives it to them, Ezra lets go. He's done all the organizing. He's done all the counting. He's done the praying and the fasting and leading. He's established this band of brothers to get from point A to point B, and Ezra lets go. But after the prayer and the fasting, Ezra understands, these guys understand the purpose. They understand the mission. They understand the vision. They understand this money isn't theirs. They understand that they're assigned by God to help establish the new generation. Verse 30. So the priests and the Levites, they took charge of the silver, the gold, the articles that had been given them and weighed them out to the house of God in Jerusalem. They took charge. And the streets that that group of people grew up on in Babylon began to fade in the rearview mirror. And they began the long track, four months through the desert. They prayed and fasted for God's protection. Verse 31, we set out from the Hava River on the 12th day of the first month to go to Jerusalem. And we were strengthened by our God, and he protected us from the power of the enemy, from the ambush along the way. Verse 31 really is a commentary of what had happened. We pulled our stakes. We packed up our bedrolls. We gathered our water skins. We got the animals ready. We checked the carts. We prayed for our families on the way. And through that 900 miles of four months, each night the landscape and the stars looked a little bit different. But they were ready to fight and protect their wives and children and the treasure of God as they transported through the desert. God protected us. God protected us. The power of the enemy was a real threat. The ambush of thieves and robbers was real. They didn't just lay down every night hoping that their families, their wives and kids are gonna be okay. No, they established a watch team to watch through the night because the ambush, the possibility of threat of ambush was very, very real. And they were very fearful for those that could come and steal and kill and destroy. They were so aware of the threat that was in front of them, of their own extinction, that they fasted and prayed for God's protection. They were very aware of the life-threatening trials that may be in front of them. Between 31 and 32, there's got to be a long pause. <laughs> Four months through the desert. Four months. Verse 32, so we arrived. We made it. We arrived. And as soon as we got there, we went to work. No. They rested. They rested. On the fourth day, on the fourth day, they went back to work. Verses 33 to 36, on the fourth day, the call was made. The group of men made their way to the temple, leading their creaking carts through the streets of Jerusalem in front of all the other refugees who had returned decades before, horses and ox carts clomping down the street with tons and tons and tons of silver and gold in their carts, and they pulled up to the temple. 
and they started unloading. Each man who had been commissioned months before was now relieved of the pressure and this valuable cargo. And they were free from the burden and the responsibility. Verse 34, everything was verified by number and weight. Everything was accounted for. And the exiles offered up praise and worship to God because of how God had provided for the trip. In verse 36, the band of brothers then gives the king's laws and commands to the governing officials so that the government would support the people and the house of God. Not so that the, the, the people would support the government. Well, a few observations for us this morning. Again, the big idea is that rebuilding uh, requires courageous leadership, patience, and faith. Emmanuel continues to find her way in this new season of ministry and service, and uh, God is walking with us through perhaps a desert for us to find our place, for us to find a new voice in a new season. Observation number one is rebuilding requires courageous leadership. A small number returned with Ezra in comparison to how many were actually living in Babylon. Few felt the call to return to the, from the comforts of Babylon. On top of that, there were no Levites, no spiritual leaders who should have been out in front. The trip would have been treacherous, hard, not comfortable, demanding, risky, perhaps life-threatening. These people in Ezra 8 were brave. They were faith-filled. They wanted God to do a marvelous work in the midst of their lives as they get, went through the desert. They were trend centers. They wanted a change, believing that God had called them to honor him. There were thousands and thousands of people living in the comforts of Babylon who didn't want to take the risk. They wanted to stay put. Commentator Williams suggests life in Babylon had become so secure and comfortable that many of the Jews had no desire to take the lifelong difficult journey back to Jerusalem to face the hard work and the problems associated with building their homes and continuing God's work. These were men and women and children who were courageous because they wanted to see God do a new thing in Jerusalem and they felt called to see God's hand. These people were risk takers. These people were filled with faith. And they wanted to see God up close and personal. Observation number two. Uh, these people were, were patient people. After God had called them, after Ezra had called them and lead, led them out before the trip, they didn't just jump on their horses and go. No, they stopped. And they waited. And they were patient. God, how would you have us go forward? Will you protect us? And they humbled themselves before the trip. And they pleaded with God that he would provide and protect. They didn't just jump and go. They waited. They were patient. James Phillips in his book, booklet, A Time to Build, he says this, waiting time is never wasted time. How right he is. Sometimes in the Christian life, waiting is more important than running or doing or serving or working or anything else we might do. Ours is a frenetic age, William, uh, Phillips says. And the pace of life is such that many of us, even in our evangelical circles, no longer know how to wait. We don't know how to be still or meditate in God's presence. Instead, we are overactive and would rather be running around busy with a thousand and one other things in our Christian lives than simply waiting in quietness upon God for help and illumination and strengthening. These people that went back to Jerusalem before they went, they waited on God. They waited on God. They knew that the world and the flesh and the devil were in the desert and that thieves and robbers were just waiting to destroy them. And for us who live in the New Testament times, what are, what are our enemies the same? The world, the flesh, and the devil. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy we too are living in a desert. And we too are on our way to the new Jerusalem. 
We too need to be courageous people. We too need to be people who fast and pray and wait on God for his provision and protection. Last observation that rebuilding requires faith. Uh, These people were people who really trusted in God. They followed God. It wasn't Ezra's call that they were responding to. They were responding to God's call in their lives, and they trusted God in the leadership of Ezra and these 12 other men. These men, these people were a people of great faith. They set their hearts on looking forward, not back. They were dreamers and risk takers. They were filled with faith that God was calling and that God would provide and protect. One of the things I was thinking about was not only do we need to be courageous and patient, but how do you build faith in your life? One of the things that I observed as I was thinking about this passage is that these people were called away from the security and safety of the streets of Babylon out into the desert before they even left, and they were together. Same mind. Same heart, same vision, same passion. And before they left, they prayed and fasted together that God would not only provide and protect, but in the midst of that work, God knit their hearts together as a people. So if you are a person who wants to grow in faith, the New Testament clearly teaches us, as does the old, that fellowship is so critical. We all know people that are kind of in and out of their faith, right? Those people are not going to grow your faith. If you want to grow your faith in Jesus Christ, we need to be with other people that burn white hot for him. People who are courageous in their faith. People who are patient in their faith. People who too also want to be people filled with faith. So the value of this time, the value of coming on Sundays, the values of small groups, the value of a prayerful breakfast meeting or sharing a passage with somebody, we stoke each other's fires to be people of faith as we reorient ourselves as to how God would have us live and journey through this desert. Rebuilding requires courageous leadership, patience, and faith. Uh, In 2012, George Lucas filmed Red Tails, and uh, it provides a dramatized version of the true events behind World War II, uh, soldiers called the Tuskegee Airmen. And the nickname Red Tails was coined after a group of uh, these airmen painted the tails of their fighters red. The Tuskegee Airmen uh, were were famous for two reasons. One, because they were the first African-American military aviators in the armed forces. But the Red Tails hold a special significance, not just racially, but militarily. In the European war, uh, U.S. bombers were getting shot down at increasingly alarming rates. The problem arose when the enemy attacked. Fighter pilots protecting the bombers would reasonably leave the side of the bombers to go and fight off the enemies. Each bomber carried a crew of 10 to 11 people. Well, the Tuskegee Airmen uh, were brought in to give a different strategy. Never leave the bombers. Never. Regardless of what is happening around you, never leave the bomber. When they attacked, they stayed course. They defended their charge. The result of their steadfast devotion, only 25 of the hundreds of bombers they protected during the war was lost. Their stellar reputation became legend. If you flew a bomber, you wanted to be with the red tails. On the movie screen, the Tuskegee Airmen gather around each other in an airstrip in a foreign land. And they say this phrase, the last plane, the last bullet, the last man, the last minute, we fight. The Tuskegee Airmen are celebrated not just because they were excellent pilots, but because they never wavered from their duty. They never left their charge. No matter what happened, they stayed faithful to their calling. Ezra and his band of brothers never wavered from their duty. 
They never left their charge. No matter what happened, they were committed to getting back to Jerusalem. They were men and families of great courage, patience, and faith. And as Emmanuel continues to go forward in this new season of service and ministry, may we be a people to each other and to the world of courageous leadership, patience, and faith. Will you please bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for the opportunity, the privilege, God, to worship openly, publicly, to be under this tent and on our lawn. We thank you, God, for the gift of your word that, that, that tells the story of your faithfulness through the ages and, and your goals and priorities. God, we are all living in the desert. We may be surrounded by green, but God, we are in the spiritual desert, the spiritual wasteland, God, where the devil seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus, you are the way and the truth and the light. No one comes to the Father except through you. Jesus, you are God in the flesh who went to the cross on our behalf, who paid for all of our sin, who was buried, who was raised from the dead, who is alive now, who ascended into heaven and is sitting at the Father's right hand interceding for us. Jesus, you are the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the Prince of Peace, the Lion of Judah. Jesus, you are our refuge and our rock and our fortress. And Lord, the world would have us believe that there are all sorts of other gods, but Lord, no one has ever died for anyone's sin. No one's ever claimed to be God and proved it by the resurrection. No one has ever promised to come again. Jesus, no one has ever said you were forgiven like you have said we are forgiven. Lord, it is by grace we are saved through faith. Lord, every other faith in the world, God says you must do, do, the, do this. But Lord Jesus, you said it is finished. Account is paid. And so, Lord, we walk through this desert. We walk through this desert, God, seeking courage from you, seeking that you would give us the ability to wait on you for your empowerment and protection, and, Lord, seeking that you would increase our faith. Lord, may we encourage one another to love and good deeds as we wait for your return. God, may we be May we be like Ezra and his band of brothers. We bless you. We worship you. We thank you for this time and your word. We pray in faith in Jesus' name. Amen.